Hello and welcome again to the Constitution Study. I'm glad you could be here. My name is Paul Engel, and we are here as a group to return the Constitution to its rightful owners. That is, we, the people of the United States of America. I'm glad you could join me today. Uh, If this is your first episode, if you are new here, welcome. I'm glad you could join me. I hope you'll thank whoever pointed you this way. Uh, You'll find, uh, I think, an interesting episode today. Uh, You can find more information at the website, constitutionstudy.com. You can pick up uh, past episodes, read other blog posts. Most importantly, you can comment and ask a question. I am always looking for questions. It helps me understand uh, how my information is being communicated, but it also helps me to answer your questions. And I usually come up with uh, interesting ideas for blog and podcast episodes. If you're a returning guest... Welcome. If you're part of the team, if you're part of this movement that says we want to understand our Constitution so we can return it to not only to its rightful ownership, but its rightful supremacy in the laws and politics of this of the federal government, then welcome back. Glad you're here. Uh, head over to the, you too. Head over to the website. I'm looking for questions. Uh, I, I I love learning more about that. I'm also sharing information. Uh, there's a uh, a Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash constitution study. Um, I've uh, got a page up on, I post these on YouTube. Other ways you can engage and you can share. And that's really what I'm looking for is, is sharing. Uh, you can also sign up for my mailing list. Right now the mailing list is pretty simple. I send out generally a monthly update as to what's going on. But I'm also, as as things start happening, as, as new features come out, as new capabilities come out, uh, I hope uh, to do some more with the uh, the mailing list to tell you, you know, where will I be speaking? Uh, I'm going to be releasing a new essay soon, and you'll, you'll get information on that. So, you know, and again, if you sign up for the mailing list today, you'll get a free copy of that li- that new essay, Reading the Declaration. We look at actually the history of the Declaration of Independence, and it's important as to why we separated from Great Britain and what what were we expecting? What were their founders expecting of this new country they were forming? This new group of countries, actually. So again, I hope you'll enjoy. And, and as always, you know, if you could head over to Patreon and sponsor me, I would appreciate that greatly. Uh, I'm trying to expand the Constitution study. I'm trying to get more podcast episodes out, more blog posts out, more analysis, more information, and uh, it would help greatly to financially if there are people who could join in. And that's really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a community, an environment where we can all share. And the more I, resources I have, the more I can dedicate time to and help do this. Uh, I'm working right now to to try and set up a couple of speaking engagements. It looks like they may not happen until early next year, but opportunities to help educate others. So, again, ask questions, make comments, please support me and uh, we'll continue on with the uh, with the the blog with the podcast today. I'm going to talk about something actually hasn't been in the news much lately, but I really want I, I want to think it over. I want to spend a little time understanding this whole brouhaha about telephone metadata and the Fourth Amendment. I mean, a while back it was all over the web. It was always a big deal, and uh, even today some people talk about it, but not as much. And the whole idea was that people were people were outraged, just outraged that the government was collecting phone call metadata. How dare they? It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's unreasonable search and seizure. And, and it, it, it everybody was having a conniption. But really, if it's a question of a violation of the Fourth Amendment, it really depends on who that metadata belongs to. You see, the Fourth Amendment protects your right to privacy, yes. Specifically, your right to be secure in your persons, houses, papers, and effects. I've not heard anyone question that the contents of your emails, text, and the phone conversations are yours. But what about the phone metadata? Who owns that? Do you own the billing information for your electric company? Do you own the customer information at the car dealership or at Amazon? If not... Why would you own the billing information at the phone company? You see, you contract with your phone carrier for access to their network. In order to handle billing and contract enforcement, the phone company has to keep track of when you call and for how long. 
They also need to track who you call and who calls you to prove the call was valid. Otherwise, you just question every phone call and the phone company would have no proof that the call was real. So if the metadata is simply the billing information generated by the phone company for their records, then isn't the data theirs, not yours? Yes, it's information about you, but you did not create the data. Neither did you store the data. So how is it your data? You see, there's nothing in the Fourth Amendment protecting data about you, only things you own. The problem here arises when government wants to access information about you. <clears throat> Since the information is owned and stored by the phone company, the government requests it from them via a subpoena. Now, unlike a warrant, a subpoena can be issued by any government agency and does not require proof of probable cause. It's basically a request from the government for data. Now, the phone company has every right to require the government to get a warrant to access their data. Since what the government is looking for isn't actually about the phone company, there's no real harm to them if they release the data. And I'm sure there would be a lot of legal consequences from the government if they refused. Sure, you have a contract with the phone company, and it may even say that they are required to keep your information safe. Who here has actually read the privacy statement from all the websites you join? I doubt any of them say that those companies will keep your data safe from the government. But even if it did, the cost of defending a suit from you is nothing compared to the cost of fighting the government especially in court when the government owns the courts. So the problem is not that the phone companies are sharing our data, but that they're sharing data about us, and there is no constitutional protection against that. Remember, when the Constitution was written, the only methods of communication were either face-to-face -face or by writing a document. This means the Fourth Amendment protections were absolutely adequate for that day. The problem is technology has changed in the last 240 years, yet no one has bothered to amend the Constitution to keep up with the times. Now, we've talked a lot about the fallacy of the Constitution being a living document. That means it, it means what it means, whatever the reader wants it to mean. When changes that naturally occur over time, our founders realized it have to have a method of updating the Constitution to take that into effect. It was designed that way. Article 5 gives us a method of updating, amending the Constitution, either to fix problems in the Constitution or to keep up with the times. See, see when, when changes that naturally occur mean the principles of the Constitution are no longer effective, then it's time to amend it and restore the principles of protecting our rights. Therefore, I propose the following constitutional amendment. Quote, the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, documents, papers, and effects, including data and records created by them or about them against unreasonable searches and seizures, shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. You may notice I just took the Fourth Amendment and added a couple things to it. I added documents to the list of things that we can be secure in. Why? Because our documents aren't always on paper. Our documents now are digital. They're electronic. I also said that, that they would be secure in their data and records either created by them or about them. Now, we've been talking about about them, but why do I say created by them? Because many of us store these documents now in cloud storage. Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, myriads of places. And current Supreme Court decisions say that once you place that in someone else's hands, you don't have any Fourth Amendment protections. So I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone. Other than that, I left the Fourth Amendment the way it is. See, by adding this language, I'm basically taking those Fourth Amendment protections and extending them to the intangible information that is so much part of our lives in the 21st century. The language protects the data we store in the cloud and, or with other third parties. Now, this would not only protect your phone metadata, but also your medical and bank records, both of which are under attack. Now, you may remember the HIPAA law, which is supposed to protect 
among other things, protect our medical records. But even that is under attack today. And bank records are have been used in the past. And the Supreme Court has said you don't need a warrant to get a person's bank records, even records that they create to, to interact and to transact with the bank. So you can read more about this in my review of the Carpenter versus Casey decision from the Supreme Court or listen to the podcast episode. You can get that uh, up on the website. And, and hopefully this would fix a lot of the problems that we're having. Now, do I expect those in Washington to propose such a simple and obvious fix to an issue so pervasive in our lives? <laughs> Not really. Why would I expect Washington to restrict their own powers voluntarily? Remember, one of the problems we had is with medical records and keeping them safe, which is the same thing. You don't create the medical records. You don't store the medical records. They're about you. But rather than fixing the problem the way they should have by amending the Constitution, Congress came up with a HIPAA law, a law that they have absolutely no justification for creating, no constitutional basis for creating because the Constitution doesn't give the federal government purview over the medical industry. Oh, well. You know what? I and, and So maybe the Article 5 amendment, uh, I'm sorry, Article 5 convention groups would propose such an amendment. I doubt that, too. Now, who knows? I may be wrong, but the, of the groups I've heard talking about a, a, an Article 5 convention, by the way, a convention of the states, not a constitutional convention, haven't mentioned amending the Fourth Amendment to deal with this. You know, at least I don't expect any changes unless and until... We, the people of the United States, start demanding that those we hire to represent us to protect our rights and the Constitution actually do it. They've sworn an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. They actually should be doing it. And if they don't, it is up to us to fire them. That's right, folks. Fire them. Come up for election say, "Uh uh-uh, you ain't doing your job. You violated your oath. You are no longer qualified You've proven yourself unqualified for the position. Bye-bye. Do I expect that to happen? Not in the near future. But I hope that as people learn and they start reading the Constitution and they start understanding, they, they start applying this information like I've done here to what's going on in front of us rather than reacting emotionally, rather than reacting as news media or politicians want you to react. But look at the constitutional basis for it. Then, and only then, will we start gaining control again. Will self-government return to we the people? And will we again have a federal system that may start working? So, uh, again, I hope you, you found this interesting. It took me a while to process because there are a lot of things we don't normally think about. But I hope by looking at this and by understanding the, the, the constitutional context of what was being said here. We see that, yes, we have a problem. The problem is our Constitution needs to be updated for the 21st century, not in the whole. The principles are there. The principle of the Fourth Amendment is no longer is no longer enforceable in the modern society, and we need to fix the Constitution to do that. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. I hope it made you think. If you have a question, please head to the website, constitutionstudy.com. Ask a question. It's in the main menu bar at the top. Uh, if you have a comment, please go to the website, comment on, the, on this podcast or on the blog post. Most of all, I hope you thought. I hope it made you consider things possibly in a different light. I hope we can continue looking for a better, freer country. And most of all, I hope to see you again next time on the Constitution Study.